Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2, released in 1987. This is one of the uh, more interesting movies I've covered here on The Kill Count, mostly because of how uninteresting it is. Because, yes, even though this is the movie that gave the internet its favorite municipal trash collecting meme, Garbage Day! No! <laughs> The entire first half of it is just a cut-down version of the first Silent Night, Deadly Night. And that's not an exaggeration. It's not until literally 40 minutes in that this movie's own story starts properly. And that's why I'm releasing this on a Saturday instead of taking up a usual Friday release slot. I just feel like that wouldn't be fair to y'all. Apparently the filmmakers were given shit for a budget and told to just re-edit the original and pass it off as a new sequel. It'd basically be a way to make free money, Matthew Lesko style. But director Lee Harry demanded to film at least something for a new story, and so we got what's essentially a 40 minute highlight reel of part one and a low budget 50 minute short film for part two. I'm not going to count all the deaths from the recap part because we already counted them in the first film's kill count, but thankfully Billy's little brother Ricky manages to score some new kills for himself. Let's find out how many and get to them. The movie begins with some dad shoes tap 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 into a title card! Also, if you're wondering why this movie footage looks like poop, it's because the Blu-ray doesn't come out until December 11th. DVDs are not HD, they're 480p. People forget that a lot. The man boy wearing them dad slippers is Ricky Chapman, Billy's brother who we saw as a baby, a young boy, and a slightly less young boy last movie. Now he's 18 and played by Eric Freeman, who is gonna fucking show you something in this movie. Right now he's getting ready to record a podcast though, with this dude Dr. Henry Bloom. This mental and institution interview will be the movie's framing device as it regales us with the story of Ricky's brother Billy Chapman, who, if you'll remember, had a pretty tragic tale. Oh. And mine isn't? Um, I don't know, Ricky. I haven't heard your story yet. Ricky yells at Dr. Bloom aggressively and sits in his chair like a cool guy, but Dr. Bloom's unfazed. He's here to hold and ford it up and get Ricky's life story, beginning by asking him who killed his parents. Santa Claus. And thus we get our retelling of Silent Night, Deadly Night, now with the occasional voiceover from Ricky that's super insightful and necessary. I don't know what made him stop. Actually, I do know what made him stop. You realize pretty quickly how extensive this recap is gonna be, and thus how pointless it is to watch this movie. Am I wasting your valuable time? Yeah, man, kind of. I already wrote an episode on the first movie. I don't wanna have to do it again. Do you know how hard it is to come up with new jokes? The recap is painfully drawn out, with not nearly enough interjections of style from the framing device. She was naughty. Or Eric Freeman's batshit line delivery. I don't sleep. During the check-ins we have with Ricky, we learn that he blames Mother Superior for what happened and is pretty much a believer in his brother Billy's crusade. Was Billy being naughty? No. They were naughty. But man, oh man, you know this recap's just padding for time when you have to sit through the Linnea Quigley scene and the fucking sledding scene all over again. It's obnoxious! Really? Well, maybe we're just jerking off here then. Uh, no, I wasn't, though that'd probably be a better time than sitting here watching this recap. 40 minutes into this quote-unquote movie, we finally see the end of the original Silent Night, Deadly Night. Naughty. Whoa, did that kid always sound like that? Very naughty. Oh, okay, I get it now. But if you had absolutely fallen in love with Eric Freeman's voiceover, don't you worry your pretty little head, because he's still got to tell us all about his life after he left the orphanage to live with a new family. The Rosenbergs. <sighs> They definitely did not get involved with Christmas. Uh... The Rosenbergs proved to be a good pair of parents for young Ricky, seen here played by a fifth actor. But five years after adopting him, Mr. Rosenberg died. And guess what? What? That hit me pretty hard. Aw, I'm sorry, dude. I'm still gonna have to throw old Pops on the count, though, due to a precedent I set in Curse of Chucky. If it's a character we've met before and then we jump to their funeral, I'm a count it. But, uh, you know, condolences and all that. One day, while a sixth actor playing Ricky was walking around in a field that production could afford to shoot in, he came upon a couple, Eddie and Paula, having a picnic in the grass. This series continues its interest in sexual violence after Paula tells Eddie no and he reacts by pinning her down and ripping her shirt open. That's enough to give Ricky flashbacks. You know, flashbacks to a scene that happened when he was a baby. And not Eric Freeman Ricky doesn't like that one bit. Naughty. And so after Eddie goes to get a beer, Ricky appears in the driver's seat of his Jeep and kills the gropey naughty boy by gassing that baby up and running him over. Then he backs up to get him a second time, and as Paula watches, gives Eddie a few more once-overs with the vehicle for good measure. How's he looking there, Rick? Good and dead? Great work. Paula avoids Ricky's wrath by thanking him for the homicide. Thank you. So at least she didn't get killed, I guess. That's an improvement. Back to our framing device. What do all those notes you're taking say about Ricky, Dr. Bloom? Oh, um... Red car. Good point. 
<laughs> Ricky tells the doc how three years later, finally as Eric Freeman, he got a job loading dumpsters and one day came across a back alley confrontation instigated by a dude named Rocco, cause of course. I don't know if it's Rocco's beatdown of a deadbeat or the red hanky he pulls out for his whoop ass sweat, but somehow Ricky gets set off again to the point that he's throwing Rocco into a bunch of basura. Garbage day is a very dangerous day. Ricky grabs Rocco and then an umbrella from the trash can and with one declaration of naughty, naughty. kills the wallaby wannabe by stabbing him through the chest. Oh, and then he opens the umbrella too? That little bit of flair elevated this kill from good to fucking great, Ricky. Oh shit, and then it starts raining and the umbrella keeps the corpse dry, kinda? Hell yeah. Dr. Bloom is finally scared straight of Ricky since those last two murders weren't anywhere in Ricky's records. Then they play a fun word association game. Punishment. Discipline. Uh, penalty. Did I do it right? But poopy pants or no, Dr. Bloom presses forward, asking Ricky about this headshot of actress Elizabeth Caden, who we've seen on the kill count before. She was in Friday the 13th Part 7. You know, the one where Jason killed teenagers. She played Robin. You know, the one girl who got topless and then killed by Jason. Wait a minute. Ricky tells the doc that back when he was an American badass on a motorcycle, he got knocked over by a car one time and had to put on his extra mean badass face. Sure, it may have caused an insurance headache, but one look at the gams that got out of that car and Ricky was hook, line, and sinker for Elizabeth Caden's character in this movie, Jennifer. Ricky and Jennifer lived a beautiful life together, full of riding his motorcycle through Griffith Park and the Toontown Tunnel and making love to each other in a bunch of dissolving close-up shots. Only problem is, Ricky sounds like he had some hang-ups. That was my first time. I thought it was Jennifer's too. Oh god, he's one of those. The two of them go to a movie theater where there's an annoying jerkwad in the back row. Let's go! Start the movie! By horror movie law, you know that dude's gonna get it. But first, hey Jenny, what movie are y'all here to see? Oh, it's great. It's about this guy who dresses up like Santa Claus and kills people. What? I'm holding you up, asshole. What? That... That's Silent Night, Deadly Night 1. You know, the first movie, the one that Ricky is in? The one that we spent 40 minutes recapping at the start of this? What the fuck? This movie's so bogus. <laughs> yeah, dude, you said it. Ricky runs out yelling punish, and Jennifer gets a visit from her bleach blonde mulleted ex-boyfriend. Chip. Yuck. While Chip asks Jennifer if she can help finish bleaching his sideburns, a few rows back, Ricky pays the theater jerk a visit in a shot where, whatever, at least they try to have some fun with it, I guess. Shh. Naughty. The guy gets killed in a cartoonish way by Ricky behind some seats. Yo, where does pissed off looking friend go though? Is that dude an accomplice to murder now? Chip leaves Jennifer and then, hey, what do you know? Ricky's back. I'm beginning to like this picture. Well, that makes one of us. Sometime later, Ricky and Jennifer are walking through a suburb when they find the chipster working on his car. He grabs at Jennifer's arm and mentions all the sexy times they had before, which turns Ricky into a veritable grumpy cat. That's enough. That's what she said when I fucked her brains out in the backseat of Oh, red here. Ricky's had enough of this naughty talk, so he sticks Chip's head under the hood and clamps a jumper cable to, uh, what, his tongue? An especially prominent molar? He turns on the battery charger, and the resulting electricity that surges through Chip's head is powerful enough to burst apart his eyeballs and sunglasses. Nice! Chip's never gonna be able to do the deal with it thing ever again. Jennifer gets real upset at Ricky, calling him crazy and saying that she hates him, but that just leads to the expected result. Punish! <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> it sounded like she put too much detergent in the wash or something. Uh oh. Ricky kills Jennifer, who he claimed was the most important person in his life or some shit, by strangling her with a car antenna. God, what a lazy fucking half assed romance to make part of his backstory. It doesn't matter though, because this next scene is literally the reason we're all here. Ricky's suburban killing spree kicks off with a cop who tells him to freeze and points a gun at him. Let's be real civilized about this. Okay. After the cop gets stupidly close to Ricky, he wrestles the gun away and shoots the cop in the head. Man, they didn't even try to make that kill exciting. I guess Eric Freeman's gonna have to make up for how lame that was with a bunch of forced laughter. <laughs> Ooh, careful there, dude. You're getting awful close to Goldblum territory. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky goes on a shooting spree, first targeting a football fan who came outside with a beer in his hand, and then, of course, in the kill you've already seen, a dude taking out his trash. Garbage day! Huh? No! Ah! But had you seen that pistol spin before? Like, maybe you have. I don't know if that was part of the meme or not. The final kill here occurs after Ricky shoots a car driving down the street. Bingo! 
The car flips on its side, narrowly avoiding that stunt performer, and then tumbles into a finish where it just blows straight the fuck up. Oh man, hey movie, you're not Lethal Weapon. Calm down with the obvious stunt scene. Cars don't freaking do that, man. Ricky winds up at a police barricade where he can't help but give more of that awful, awful laugh. <laughs> Knowing the jig is up, he raises the gun to his temple while the cops shout out generic phrases to try to talk him down. No! Not worth it! Don't be a fool! Don't do it! Don't kill yourself! But when Ricky goes to pull the trigger, Lady Fate intervenes and steals the last laugh for herself. No more bullets. But apparently, Ricky doesn't need bullets to kill people, as he somehow managed to strangle Dr. Bloom to death while he was regaling the audience with his garbage day adventures. See, this is why we made the switch to digital. No tape for people to get killed with. Ricky's first action as a free man is to murder one of those charity Santa Clauses off screen. He's gotta look the part when he calls and harasses Mother Superior, after all. Santa's back! Thanks, Charity Santa, dude. This movie wouldn't really fit the whole Christmas theme I'm doing here without that outfit. Although it looks like Ricky left the beard. Aw, he'll be like a little boy Santa. Mother Superior lives by herself after suffering from a stroke, which for some reason, what, are they saying a stroke did that to her face? She's still an old curmudgeon, though, complaining about parades on TV and kids having fun outside. Lighten up, lady, it's your main man's B-Day. Ricky gets to her house, which has an extremely unlikely address, and kicks down the door to let himself in. She tries to barricade him out of a room, but dude's got an axe and this is a horror movie. Let's see what kind of Jack Torrance riff they do. <laughs> oh, there you are! Oh, F minus for that one. And that's not even a real grade. Eventually, La Madre Superiora tries to bluff her way out of the situation, saying Ricky must be punished like his naughty brother Billy. But he basically tells her whole damn system to fuck off. Naughty this! With that, he kills her off screen, and after the cops arrive at her house, thanks to some nun intelligence, they find her dead in her wheelchair, apparently having been friggin' decapitated. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty wiped out right now, guys. Could you just imagine I made a great joke about her being the head of an abbey or something? Thanks. When Ricky steps out with his axe, he gets shot by the police there. Not once or twice, but three times. He's out. Out through a back patio door, that is. But don't get too excited, you stupid bastards, because the movie ends with this fuck opening his eyes, guaranteeing one more stupid sequel surrounding Ricky Chapman. Will half an original movie only give us half the kills? The math checks out, but let's double check the numbers. Garbage day! 13 people died in Silent Night Deadly Night Part 2, which is actually the same number as its full-length predecessor. The victims included 10 men, 2 women, and 1 motorist of an indeterminate gender, giving us this not-so-festive pie chart. Seriously, what's the gray stuff? Is it delicious? With a total runtime of 88 minutes, we wound up with a new kill on average every 6.78 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Rocco. The only other death that gave it competition was the car battery one, but when he opens the umbrella through Rocco's back, oh man, that seals the deal. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to the theater jerk, because it seems more like a throwaway gag in a Disney Channel show than a proper death in a slasher film. And that's it. Silent Night Deadly Night Part 2 came out in 1987 and would probably be entirely forgettable if not for Eric Freeman's free wheeling performance. The next sequel would be entirely forgettable, and we'll look at that next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this extra Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Alex Gill and Rez. I also want to keep thanking patrons who have been with me for over a year. People like Daphne Ferreira, Daniel DeLeon, Matthew Pustov, Nick, aka Zom80075. Oh, and holy shit, Tiffany Mink? That's awesome. Thanks, Tiff. This franchise has a ton to offer The Kill Count. These episodes are some of my favorites. Be good people.